Developed in only 19 months, the Chrysler Sunbeam was the result of a desperate failing car builder to secure the funding of the British government and potentially reverse its fortunes. The outcomes of this rapid delivery being a perfectly serviceable little car that also formed the basis of one of the most renowned hot hatchbacks ever to be built. The story begins in 1975, during the height of Britain's downward spiral in relation to the car industry. With a mixture of terrible union relations and the huge influence of the newly arrived Japanese firms, seeing the domestic auto builders face an almost complete collapse as their market shares fell month by month. Of the mainstream UK car companies, the Ford and Vauxhall firms weathered the storm by way of outsourcing much of their work to their much more harmonious European partners, while British Leyland faced bankruptcy in December 1974 and was thus partially nationalised under the National Enterprise Board, an arm of the government tailored for the operation of major industries in Britain. For Chrysler UK, which had acquired the former Roots Group during 1967, this was a company truly facing the end of its life as amid the already collapsing market share of the Roots Group by the time of the Chrysler purchase, the firm was also hamstrung by woeful worker relations and the lack of a European partner with shared models that could help outsource some of the work. While Chrysler also controlled the Simca company in Europe, the two firms had yet to implement a universal model strategy that allowed for Simca cars being built on the continent to be batched as Chrysler's in Britain. Simca holding a minor share of the UK market, but had developed models in line with European tastes rather than British ones. The result was Chrysler being forced to endure sluggish and often poor quality production from their UK factories in Coventry and Linwood, with the Linwood plant, built in the 1960s for the production of the ill-fated Hillman Imp, being one of the biggest financial drains in the company, while the first dedicated pan-European car for the firm, the Chrysler Alpine and Simca 1308, was still undergoing final testing before release into the market. In the wake of the Ryder Report, which was drafted by the National Enterprise Board as a means of setting the forward planning for British Leyland, Chrysler UK concluded that other British car builders should be allowed state subsidies in order to ensure their survival for the immediate period. Aware that the government needed to ensure employment in deprived areas of the country or risk political consequences come election time. Thus, Chrysler gave the British Parliament an unhappy choice of either investing in their future or the American giant would end its UK operations and leave thousands out of work, Chrysler hoping to receive the full assistance of the NEB, but in the end this would amount to only a joint declaration of faith from the UK government and Chrysler's American parent company over the future of the UK operation. Thus, a state grant was dispatched to help fund the development of a new small family car that would combat the likes of the Volkswagen Golf and the Renault 5 for the rapidly emerging hatchback market. This model to be engineered at the Wrighton plant near Coventry, styled at the Whitley Technical Centre also near Coventry, and then built at the Linwood plant in southern Scotland. Much of the incentive behind the government's agreement to Chrysler's demands was the fact that several by-elections were upcoming in marginal seats across the West Midlands, and this open show of support for UK workers was hoped to curry favour with this particular segment of the population. With funding supplied, the write and design team had to deliver as soon as possible, and work commenced from January 1976, the new car, based on an extremely limited budget, needing to be as simple as possible when it came to engineering, while sourcing as many parts from other Chrysler products as possible to keep bespoke manufacturing costs down. The machine chosen for development was in fact not a new car, but instead a revived scheme dubbed Project R424, which was based on a 3-inch shorter version of the Hillman Avenger platform and fitted with a modified Hillman Imp engine, with the only major work being to amend the Avenger's body panels into a practical hatchback and give the rest of the car its own unique style. The car's Avenger roots were evident in the fact that the upcoming R424 was a rear-wheel drive hatchback, as opposed to its front-wheel drive contemporaries, though despite the car being based on near-decade-old underpinnings, its exceptionally low cost was a compelling financial argument, especially when considering that, beyond the upcoming Alpine, the only other new car proposed by Chrysler was a Simca 1100 replacement with two years of its development left. Thus, the R424 rushed through its development stage thanks to its technical simplicity and widespread use of tried and tested parts, with all hands at the Whitley Technical Center being put into the car's styling, Avenger components being adopted wherever possible, including a slightly refreshed Alpine-style dashboard that was simply an evolution of the Avenger's molding. 
Roy Axe initially headed the process at Wrighton, while the styling of the machine was deliberately made to be as risk-free as possible through a very simple but sturdy layout, its aesthetics being generally in line with those of the upcoming Chrysler models, thus meaning it could easily fit into the product range without looking too much like an outsider. As an example of Chrysler's reliance on the parts bin, the car was originally meant to utilize the light cluster and grille of the proposed 1100 replacement, the Chrysler Horizon, but when it was found that these mouldings would not be available until at least 1977, the Wright and Design team simply adopted the sealed beam units from the Avenger and would carry these through long after the launch of the Horizon. In terms of branding, the R424 was originally to revive the Sunbeam brand for the UK, one of the original firms acquired to create the wider Roots Group, this mark only being used in an official capacity on European versions of the Hillman Avenger. Though as Chrysler simply wanted a machine with a pan-European appeal, the hatchback would eventually be christened the Chrysler Sunbeam as a compromise. Thus, after only 19 months of development, against the usual convention of three to five years, the Chrysler Sunbeam was launched on July 23, 1977, making it one of the shortest development programs for a mainstream car in automotive history, second only to the Triumph TR2 of 1953. Initial response from the motoring press was generally sympathetic, acknowledging Chrysler's lack of funds and requirement to deliver in as short a time as possible, the only real criticisms being due to the Sunbeam's lack of interior space and its high loading lip, though overall it was praised for its pleasant handling, good looks and swift performance in the larger engined versions. However, critical success would not be enough to ensure the continued autonomy of Chrysler's UK division, and thus the rest of the model range would need to adapt in order to confirm the Sunbeam as the company's big seller with no overlap. The Chrysler Horizon, as a replacement for the 1100, being no smaller than a five-door hatchback, while the two-door basic Avengers were removed from production. This streamlined product range worked wonders, and sales for the Chrysler Sunbeam were very strong, while despite being a rear-wheel drive car, the machine showed strong performance when compared to its closest front-wheel drive rivals, the Ford Fiesta and the Volkswagen Golf. However, Chrysler UK needed to ensure that the Sunbeam would be a household name, while at the same time answering the emerging and highly popular trend for performance-orientated versions of new small family cars dubbed hot hatchbacks, with the Volkswagen Golf GTI, the Vauxhall Chevette HS, and the upcoming Ford Escort XR3, being models that essentially delivered the driving characteristics of sports cars, but with a practical body shell and a far lower asking price. Thus, the first hot hatchback version of the Sunbeam arrived in 1979 as the Sunbeam TI, being powered by a 1.6-litre Avenger Tiger engine and included twin Verba carburettors that helped to deliver 100 horsepower, though in order to maximise performance, the Sunbeam TI had to be stripped out when it came to internal refinements and thus meant it was completely ill-suited for the role of a road car due to its noise, harshness and temperamental nature. However, the Sunbeam TI would find its niche among the rally championships of Europe and would worm its way into the hearts of both drivers and enthusiasts thanks to a plethora of off-the-shelf tuning parts, performance for the car being a 0-60 time of 9.9 .9 seconds and a top speed of 111 miles an hour. This wasn't the end of the Sunbeam's foray into motorsport, as during 1977, competitions manager at Chrysler UK, Des O'Dell, sought out a potential replacement for the Avengers Tiger and BRM amid a vicious rivalry taking place between the Ford Escort RS and the Vauxhall Chevette HS, the only way to ensure success being to marry a short three-door hatchback model with rear-wheel drive to a 2.3-litre 16-valve engine. While the Tiger was replaced by the TI, the BRM required something more and thus Chrysler approached Lotus to supply engines and assist in the development of Chrysler's new rally weapon, leading, in 1978, to the first two-litre prototype being produced that was fast, agile and reliable. Thus, an agreement was made to produce a limited number of these cars so as to meet the homologation regulations of the FIA, and thus the new Sunbeam was unveiled at the 1979 Geneva Motor Show, wearing a striking black with silver stripe colour scheme and Lotus alloy wheels. However, Chrysler would not see the success of the Lotus-based specials, as during the development of these cars, the American giant, amid its own losses being incurred on the domestic market of the United States, had to cut off as much debt as possible or risk total collapse, the Chrysler UK firm still being burdened by the debts 
of the previous Roots Group, which still hadn't been repaid over a decade later. Thus, in 1978, Chrysler had sold both its UK and European divisions to the PSA Peugeot Citroën Group for a derisory sum of just $1, with those cars formerly sold under the Chrysler brand re-emerging under the long-dormant Talbot moniker, leading to the creation of the Talbot Sunbeam. However, the Lotus cars were pushed through to fruition, and would have been a huge success with a projected run of 4,500 units, though in the end, due to the influence of the 1979 fuel crisis, only 2,308 of what were dubbed the Sunbeam Lotus were eventually built. Nevertheless, the Sunbeam Lotus was a rally stage darling, performing in the hands of Henri Thiovenin to win the 1980 World Rally Championship, as well as take the Lombard RAC Rally, thus breaking Ford's string of successes, though for 1981, Stig Blomqvist's attempts to replicate the previous year's victories didn't come to pass, thus bringing an end to the career of the Sunbeam in competition. For 1981, the Talbot Sunbeam received its only facelift, with flush horizon-style headlamps and better integrated bumpers being adopted, though sadly, the future prospects of this jaunty little hatchback were not to last, due primarily to the continued instability of what had formerly been Chrysler UK. While the Peugeot takeover of the firm in 1978 had saved the company from complete collapse, much pruning needed to be made in order to correct its financial course and as part of the rationalisation schemes implemented by Talbot Managing Director and former British Leyland executive George Turnbull, the Linwood plant was slated for closure after only 18 years of operation. Being the primary assembly plant for both the Avenger and the Sunbeam, an appraisal of these models illustrated that they had not the market presence to justify the transfer of their tooling and equipment to the Wrighton plant in Coventry. For the Avenger, this car was dropped simply by virtue of it being 11 years old, and now surrounded by much younger contemporaries, while the Sunbeam's axing was a mixture of both the fact that its 19-month development cost had been easily paid off by its sales fortunes, and because the PSA group sported a wide variety of similar hatchback models, including the Citroen Visa and the Peugeot 104. Thus, Linwood was closed in 1981, and the Talbot Sunbeam met its end, the closure of the car factory having a devastating blow on the economy of southern Scotland and would see the area plunged into the deep and pervasive unemployment so hope could be avoided by the government when the Roots Group was tasked with establishing the plant back in 1963. As for the Talbot Sunbeam, despite its hasty development and fleeting four-year assembly run, the car managed to sell a respectable 200,000 units, maintaining a strong presence on the small family car market against the likes of the Ford Fiesta and the Vauxhall Chevette. However, while the Talbot Horizon 5 door would go on to replace the Avenger in the model lineup, even seeing moderate sales success in the United States as the Dodge Omni, the Talbot Sunbeam's place in the market, despite the presence of products from Peugeot and Citroen, would not be left unoccupied. In 1981, Talbot launched the Samba three door hatchback, which was essentially a refaced Peugeot 104, and had been developed in just 20 months, this model being built in France and Spain and would last in production until 1986, after which the Talbot name was dropped and its former product range merged into the wider PSA group. In summary, the Sunbeam, despite all the odds, demonstrated that a perfectly capable mass production car could be delivered in a very short space of time while using a plethora of shared components from the parts bin, thus seeing an incredible return on investment thanks to strong market penetration and low development costs. However, it was in rallying that the unsuspecting and boxy sunbeam would find its brief but exceptionally memorable calling, and today is remembered fondly as the car that broke Ford's phenomenal run of successes on the rally stage, with the sunbeam now a much-cherished underdog in the motoring scene that shows there's far more to a car than what meets the eye.